we knew kids would come between us. Like they're almost engineered to try to pull the two of you apart. I'm lucky enough to be joined by the author of the best-selling book, Dad on Purpose, David Bauer. Amongst other things, he talks about what it's like being a dad to identical twins and also why it's important to have a really structured parenting style. Why you wanted to write the book? I think that my wife and I had waited a long time before having children. We had 10 years of our relationship with four children. And we had a lot of friends who had children and relatives had children. And we both started to realize, okay, this is how we don't want to do things. This is really not good. This is terrible. We're never going to do this. Hey, if we ever have them, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. But we started having, she had a couple of restaurants going. And so the question was, should we have children at all? And then finally we decided, what well, if we're going to have them, we're going to start having them. And then we had twins after the first one. Kind of. So we had 16 months and 16 minutes between our three children. Wow. Three children under two years old. The twins were identical. And so it had to be very purposeful. It had to be like, okay, which one? You know what? We have a Medina and Zoe. Zoe and Toe Rhyme. Zoe's toe is going to be red. Red toenail polish on Zoe. That's how we know which one's Zoe. So, so it's we easy to know which one was which. And when we couldn't tell for the first whatever year. And I mean, when you say identical, can you literally not tell them apart, even as their parents? I'll tell you what happened is that three years old, Zoe was putting her toenail polish on. And I said, Zoe, you know, I don't think you need to put your toenail polish on anymore. She goes, I don't. I said, that was so I could tell you and your sister apart. And she said, can I still put it on? I said, yeah. And she goes, okay. As soon as they can talk, you can tell them what. They're not dead, but they're, it's also like you can tell which one when you live with them. And then now as adults, you, you can see it in them. There's little differences. Yeah. yeah. That's fascinating though, isn't it? The idea of identical twins. Any parents listening, well, that will resonate of how hard mm. just becoming a parent for one child, but the two children, you're just, I don't know how you do that. I don't. I yeah, think well, you have to be on purpose. I think that's what we learned, at least was a way to be successful, was to have things actually set up where you could have success, whatever that success was, to have it purposefully. And an example of that was, I put in there, it's about laundry. You have this 18-month-old watching her two-month-old sisters, and we had laundry coming out of our whatever. Yeah, I bet. And and she's like, you know, I want to help. I want to help. And so all of a sudden it became, she started helping during laundry. And it was all about passing time. Because yeah. when, you have, when you have six hours with a kid and you don't want to have TV on all the time, it doesn't matter whether the laundry is it's something to do. And so it started as simple as that. Well, by the time they were five, I never did their laundry again. The other learns from the other. And all of a sudden they don't want to add up in their laundry. And I never did again. And I knew they went to college and they had found kids they were at college with. Who had never done their own lunch. So oh, yeah. it, it was nice that they had had so the big thing. It was as simple as that. Here are the six things like sleeping and eating and washing that we really try to get very strict with our children. I was going to say the probably the one thing that probably unites all parents is just the lack of sleep. The one constant that every parent who I've spoken to on a podcast, we always end up talking about sleep. And I know how incredibly hard it is with one child. How do you do it with? Because I'm guessing they don't sleep at the same time, twins. I mean, so the first chapter of my book is the 12 guiding principles, but the next chapter is called sleeping. And sleeping is everything. And, and I learned so much from my friends on what not to do about sleeping. I learned all the things you do not do. And I think we took right from the beginning a very strong approach with what is expected at night, which is they're going in there, they're going to bed and they're not getting out and they can scream and cry. And we had like, I think I put in the, in there, it was an hour and a half, maybe it was 75 minutes, just screaming and yeah. sobbing. But you know what? Eventually she fell asleep. She was okay. Next night it was a little longer. The next night it was a little shorter. After 11 days, she just, that's what happened. Did one of them manage to sleep and the other one didn't manage to sleep? One of the things that we learned was when you got one up because they were hungry in the middle of the night, you got the other one up and you fed them. Whether they were sleeping or not, it didn't matter. My wife would get up, she'd feed one, then she'd feed the other, you know, because we, we were still, you know, trying to do it on breast. And we would trade that off. I'd go get each one, I'd change each one, I'd put each one down. And that's what happened. They have their own room separate from theirs. 
her 16 month older sister. And we had to do that. When they get to about four months. They have to start sleeping through the night. And yeah, so we that's got full on. Talking with you now, it does bring it all back. The moments of desperation, we like, I don't know if I can do this. It's two in the morning and you've got to get up in five hours to work. I said, you don't have a choice. So you just do what you've got to do. In some ways, it's, I suppose it's a bit of a relief. It was a relief for my wife when actually I could help out and bottle feed because then at least yeah. there's another person who can help. Well, fair play because the idea of Twins, especially twins, as you said, we were in a similar position. My daughter was probably about 18 months when our middle, our son was born. And luckily she was good as gold. The boys are a yeah. di different kettle of fish. They're the neediest. We've still got a six-year-old in our bed most nights. My mum always says, you really need to stop that. I'm up. You're right. I agree with you. Both of us work full time. I think there's a danger in our society. We're trying to do too much and end up just doing it badly. Y'all should not read my book. I, I kind of scorn you all uh, very harshly in the book. Because I do feel like it really risks the relationship with your significant other. I definitely think we've gone backwards. In When I look at the way I was brought up, my mum looked after us in the house. My dad went to work. I, and arg, a lot of arguments people would say, and we can't afford to do that. I think that's the problem economically. I don't know how it is in the States, but we, no. my wife's got a good, she's a teacher. She's got a good job. No. I've got a small business. We both no. work full time and yeah, we still absolutely. can't make ends meet some months. Yeah. And that's the problem really, that it's so right. expensive to just survive. And as you said, it can really damage your marriage because you end up sleeping in different parts of the house. And it's like you're passing like ships in the night. And I, I took a pretty harsh stand on that. I think I learned that from my dad that dogs are dogs, kids are kids. They're not the same as your spouse. Okay. You can have a lot of different kids, a lot of different dogs, one spouse. And yeah. so we were very, very strong on our, you know, yeah, we made that joint cooperation at the very beginning, or we weren't going to have them. I think that was the other thing because we knew kids would come between us. Like they're almost engineered to try to pull the two of you apart. So I, I think that it's one of those things where you have to go in knowing that there is a strategy you have to at least have going in and, and have a discussion about how it's going. And yeah. so I think that's what Dad on Purpose is all about, just trying to at least identify where the problems are and what happens with these things and how to get out of it. I did check out your book and I, I, I actually agree with you in a lot of ways. Things come full circle and I think we've got to the point where Men and women, husbands and wives thinking they can do it all. And actually, I think we're going to end up going back to a much more traditional. It might be that, that, it's, the, 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 that it's the dad that stays at home and brings up if that works. And that's what works for me. I work from home. I drop the kids off at school and pick them up. And I'm lucky enough to work around that while my yeah. wife goes to school. But I think you need that. We got into a position where we were spending so much on childcare that some days it was costing me to go to work. Yeah. And the kids were miserable. The kids hated being dropped off at some random person's house. They wanted me or my wife to drop them off. And I've, as you said, I've seen it. I've seen that imbalance and lack of structure in the house come between couples. I know a number of couples who are either really struggling or divorced just because it's not working, yeah, which is really yeah. sad. I think part of the reason I waited so long to write this book is even when I was in the midst of it, I was taking a lot of notes on things that worked and things that didn't work and making funny stories out of them. And because a lot of things happened over time. And I think by me being able to look back, because my kids are now 29 and 30, I, and they're getting married. I, I have the opportunity to see, okay, this is, this is what happened. This is what worked. This is what didn't work. This is yeah. what I really struggled with. And this is what I shouldn't have worried so much about. And I think that's why I was ready to write a book. I was also ready to put something down because I want to write a book. And I had to talk to them all about what part of all the stories they would all agree with me writing. Just change the name. Out. Yeah. So I, I, instead of promising, I call it book one because we all agreed that I could go up to 10 years old without getting in a lot of trouble. First of all. Um, so, and so that's what the book is about on the first part. And again, I think that's the most critical part. If you can get that right, then a lot of it is about trust and worrying a little less. They put some good structure in, and I think they did okay. It's really nice to read a book, and I, a lot of reviews I've had on my book, people have said it's nice to hear a man's perspective. 
because it's, yeah. it's quite rare. When I first found out I was becoming a dad, I did read a few books and they just felt a bit, I just thought this has been written by a woman. This hasn't been written by a man. And actually yeah. it's really good. And my, I very much discuss mental health and how that can affect being a parent. But there needs to be a lot more support for young dads. I think, to be honest with you, I think men in general are in a bit of a crisis. And I think new dads quite often might not have a great relationship with their own dad or might not even know their own dad. There is definitely a real gap, certainly in Britain, of quite young dads. I, I first became a dad at 36, so I was pretty late. Becoming a dad in your early 20s, I wouldn't have had a clue. I only just had no. a clue in my mid, mid to late 30s. No. But you're still a child in your t early no. 20s. I'm lucky in that my three daughters have met three incredible dads to be. Brilliant. Not dads yet, but I know that they all have that in common. I, I walk with them. I talk with them for hours and gone to baseball games with them. And so I know the kind of men they are and I'm looking forward and they seem to be looking forward to having me help guide at least like I did from the book's perspective, not necessarily coming and asking me any questions, but just knowing, okay, this is this general philosophy. I think they like that. And I do agree with you that none of the three of them got that from their dad. I was very lucky to have a good relationship with my dad. He didn't have a relationship with his dad. So to an extent, he had to kind of guess at it. And he was, I, was, I couldn't have been happier. I had a great childhood. I really feel for people who don't know their parents or don't know, or don't have a good relationship. So I, and I think you're fine. I don't know how you felt, but the minute you become a, a dad, oh my goodness, all I wanted to do was talk to other dads. I was like, I need the answers. So the fact yeah. that so having someone who is a, a kind, non-judgmental, friendly person to say, look, I don't know what I'm doing. And maybe even so, can you just help me out here? Because it's so hard. Certainly the first few years, I think it's as much just becoming a dad, becoming a parent is enormous but also how that affects your relationship. That's really hard because no one tells you, you don't know what's going to happen. Your yeah, partner look, keep... look I, I really try to point it out. Yeah. She said, look, I don't want to have kids at all. If we're going to be really hating each other by the time this is over, let's just not have it. We like where we are right now. Yeah. And we talked about that. And I kind of was like, God, I really need kids. And I, I think I need the kids and I need to be a dad. I think my dad, I had a relationship with my dad. We're in a great relationship, but my dad, was really a part of my life. And I think that it was important for me to really be there on purpose. I was 33 and 30, yeah, 33 and 35 when I had my kids. So I know you have that opportunity to be a little more perspective. I really hope you got some in this video. And if you like what I'm trying to do to support other parents, please share it with someone and maybe even think about subscribing. Worst case scenario, if I start annoying you after a month, you can always unsubscribe. That's what I did. All right, wherever you're in the world, you're okay. Take care. Hey, Dad, here's a word from our sponsor. Do you miss having something interesting to read in those very odd five-minute breaks from the trench warfare that can be family life? If so, check out www.swifthalf.com. Sign up to their newsletter for jaw-dropping news, some light-hearted nonsense, exclusive offers and guides.